Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, lunchtime lecture sponsored by the Friends of the Bodleian. The Friends of the Bodleian is a charity that uh, raises money for acquisition and conservation. And any of you joining us who are not members might want to take, might wish to take a look at our website, see the sort of work we do, and hopefully uh, support us. It makes a great deal of difference to, to the Bodley to have this extra income fund in order to support its activities. So I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, who is Linda Muggleston. Uh, Linda Muggleston is an internationally acknowledged authority on the development and use of the English language. She is currently a member of the Oxford English faculty and a fellow of Pembroke College. Many of you will remember that she recently co-curated the Art of Advertising exhibition at the Western Library using the language of advertising as a social witness to the past. Her very short introduction to dictionaries, published by OUP in 2011, explores the history and use of the dictionary as a linguistic and cultural phenomenon. And she has also written numerous books on lexicology, uh, lexicography, and uh, uh, particularly um, Samuel Johnson and the Journey into Words, uh, published by OUP in 2015. And at the moment, uh, Linda is nearing the end of a research project, which is being funded by the uh, Leverhulme uh, Trust, called Words in Wartime, which examines language change during World War I. Um, through the archival collections of Andrew Clarke, which are held uh, at the Bodley. And a new monograph, Writing a War of Words, Andrew Clarke and the Search for Meaning in World War I, will be published uh, by OUP in October of this year. And it's on uh, Andrew Clarke that Linda is going to talk to us today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to her. Right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for um, to Richard for his generous introduction today and also for the to the Friends of the Bodleian for inviting me to give this lecture and of course to everyone for um, coming to listen to it, particularly given the amazing weather outside. Right, lovely. So as my title indicates, my focus today is going to be on the past and mainly on one point in history, the First World War and the challenges as met by one writer, Andrew Clark, to try and record its words, its idioms and its changing expressions in the extraordinary collection of almost 100 densely documented notebooks that he deposited in the Bodleian between 1915 and 1922. As part of this though, I also want to explore some of the challenges that trying to make a real-time collection poses, and especially I want to invite you to think about Clark's interest in seizing the linguistic moment in what is, as you'll see, a quite literally handcrafted archive of words. Each notebook was, in effect, to be a precise response to English itself as an artifact of time and vested in the impulse to preserve what is potentially ephemeral from oblivion. So to begin, we might turn for context, I think, to a statement made um, here, in fact, in another lecture that was given in Oxford, also in June, but this time in 1900, by James Murray, editor of the first edition of the Oxford English Dictionary and a work that was, at that point, still slowly making its way through the alphabet. As Murray stated then, as you can see on my slide, original work, patient induction of facts, minute verification of evidence, these are all slow processes, said Murray, and a work so characterised, as he added with some certainty, cannot be put together with scissors or paste. Clark, as we will see, did not agree. Instead, paste, scissors, and his trusty black pen or pencil were his tools of trade, while each notebook was carefully paginated, um, indexed, cross-referenced, labelled by hand, and had red ribbons neatly sewn on by his daughter. Each notebook, then, is both word hoard and scrapbook. Its pages replete, as you can see in the image on the right-hand side of my slide, with annotated clippings and images. 
Um, here, for example, we find pictures, adverts, there's a little bit about Bovril. He was very interested in Bovril, to, and he was using this at this point in this notebook to explore phrases occurring in the war and the way they were familiarised in the discourse of advertising, for example, or ephemera. Uh, the bit on the right, for example, is his interest in military. Um, as a term to do with female fashion. He was also very, very interested in female fashion and collects lots of words to do with this during the war. So we've got adverts, ephemera, leaflets, letters, reported speech, everything was examined as Clark came across it. Um, the Victorians, as Marcus Quint has argued, for example, were preeminent hoarders, hoarders extraordinaire. And Clark then was perhaps particularly exemplary in this respect, hoarding words and meanings in virtually every circumstance you can think of. There is a sense in which no piece of paper was in fact safe from him. Um, so, and there's lots of bits in the diaries and it was his war diaries are also in the Bodleian and also in the notebooks, narrating the way he was walking down Tell Street in Oxford found a particularly nice leaflet outside the tobacconist and ran off with it and puts it into the notebooks and <laughs> duly annotated. Or he finds himself on the high street and finds a particularly attractive recruiting poster, which like is abstracted and now is in the Bodleian as well. So he saw history, as you'll see, and particularly language history in every scrap here. So we might notice also there is a kind of principle behind this. Uh, maybe think about Clark's earlier editing of John Aubrey, particularly Aubrey's brief lives here. So Aubrey was another historian convinced of the value of the minute and the incidental. And particularly very interested in the tension between what might easily be dismissed as trivial, but which might, with hindsight, instead have value as a kind of in antiquity. So he, um, Clark shares with Aubrey this sort of historical mindfulness, a kind of quality of historical mindfulness in relation to the kind of evidence we might use. So this also played its part. All is not all is lost, said Aubrey, as you can see on my slide at the top, that is not deposited in some repository. This was another lesson of time that certainly Clark absorbed from Aubrey's work. Clark's relationship with history and how it might be told with the brief lives here of words and with the Bodleian as repository were all to be key features of his work. OK, so first of all, then, who is Clark? So we could turn, first of all, then, to the Dictionary of National Biography, which identifies him usefully as a Church of England clergyman, a scholar and a diarist. This won't, however, quite do for our purposes today, though I do quite like the comment on his phenomenal energy, as well as his acute but humane critical sense, both of which are indeed very much ev in evidence in Words in Wartime. Instead, though, today, I want to link him to the Bodleian, where he was a curator in the late 19th century, succeeding his friend, in fact, the great philologist Friedrich Max Müller, uh, as well as being a very significant donor of books and manuscripts to the Bodleian, of which more later. Though, actually, it's his links, in fact, to another great collective enterprise based in Oxford, here in the shape of the OED itself, that I want to explore first. So Clark's involvement with the OED dates, for, for example, from when he was a fellow of Lincoln College in the 1880s, right up to the beginning of World War I, when he was instead in Essex as rector of Great Lees, a living that was in fact also in the gift of Lincoln College, and from where he was still very, very actively engaged in scholarship, research, and work for the university. So Words in Wartime then might be a definitively 20th century project, pro, uh, project based as it is in World War I, but its intellectual roots, as I want to show you first, lie in fact in Victorian Oxford and what was at that point seen as a radically new approach to language, lexicography and the life of words. The OED's unique selling point, for example, lay in its own historical engagement with time and change. As its original title page makes plain, for example, historical principles were fundamental to its identity. And we can see this also in its original title as a new English dictionary. 
So it aimed in this um, to be quite different to other English dictionaries that had previously existed. So it aimed to, above all to present not only a great inventory of English, a register of all words objectively recorded, but also a kind of biography of each word based on a vast collection of dated citations by which, as Murray stated, each word would be able to tell its own story. So from the beginning then, as the text of one of Murray's appeal, which I've got on the right of my slide here, I have, as this shows us, it also depended for much of this evidence, the stuff that would go in to make the dated evidence of the biographies, um, into, uh, it depends then, then on the collective um, efforts of a diverse set of readers. It's a kind of democracy of effort that links, say, authors such as Ruskin or Charlotte Young with college servants in Oxford. Oxford or school children, particularly those who used to attend the school that Murray taught us in London, and unsurprisingly, perhaps also with Clark himself. Um, so we can think about this very interesting statement. Um, we call upon Englishmen to come forward and write their own dictionary for themselves as the early proposal for the dictionary had proclaimed. So collective endeavour of this kind was a prerequisite. As Ruskin wrote to the dictionary after working and reading in, in, in this way, he said, a word hunt to me has become an ex as exciting as a fox hunt to others. Clark would definitely agree. So reading for words then, in this slide was part of a kind of accidental apprenticeship on which we can see Clark enthusiastically embarking long before World War I begins. It came, as you can see on this slide still, with precise instructions. Make a quotation for every word that strikes you as rare, obsolete, old fashioned, new, peculiar, or used in a peculiar way, Clark was told. Take special note of passages which show or imply that a word is either new or tentative. Each quotation that he found in this way was to be dated and carefully attributed to its source. Possible headwords were carefully underlined. A template was usefully provided. So anything that he sent into the dictionary or any of these readers sent into the dictionary was to be on this kind of format here. So we've got the head word here, rhinoceros, underlined, and um, we've got the quotation and we've got the date. We've got all the evidence that we might need for our potential biography of rhinoceros. So, so if we look though at Clark's earlier scholarship from this kind of perspective, um, we soon start to see that he was in reality, not only as a historian um, editing writers such as John Aubrey or say Anthony Wood, another writer whose historical interests directed careful attention to the ordinary texture of life. But he was actually at the same time also filleting them for words and word usages, for useful quotations and lexical evidence and sending the results to James Murray at his house in North Oxford. In this way, I've preserved for the collection of collector of words some quaint forms and expressions, Clark commented, for example, in his introduction to Aubrey's brief lives. What the collector of words might require echoes at a number of points throughout the text. The same was true of his other scholarly editions. Clark's English register of Osney Abbey might, for instance, be historically meaningful, but as he noted, this too was of exceptional interest as a monument of the language. Even in August 19, he was in the process of making yet another word list for the OED, this time as based on his forthcoming edition of the 15th century Lincoln Diocese document and providing in the process evidence of hundreds more words and senses, all of which duly made their way from Essex to Oxford for the surface of the dictionary. So August 1914, however, brought not only the onset of war, but a set of very interesting critical departures, both in Clark's reading and the uses to which these might be put. He would, as we will see, still read for evidence of words, as well as deploying the methods he'd carefully acquired over some 20 years of reading, as well as work behind the scenes at the OED. Nevertheless, the word list he sent to the OED in the summer of 1914 from the Lincoln Diocese documents book would prove to be his last. Meanwhile, as we'll see, 
the suggestion that the early proposal made that readers could in fact maybe write their own dictionary for themselves now assumed new and unexpected meanings. The OED, um, as we've seen, offered one model of history, but Clark had in reality long been thinking about something different, an experimental project, one in which history might be observed at first hand in all the flux and diversity that this revealed, and with data sources that departed in equally critical ways from those that had, for a variety of reasons, come to be preferred in the dictionary as text. Clark's intent to seize the moment had, even so, hitherto remained pretty much an elusive ideal. As for most of us, getting round to it can be a challenge in its own right. Usually, um, by the time he thought of doing this for a, for a specific event, as say with the Boer War at the very end of the 19th century, the decisive moment, as he admits, had just come and gone. As war drew near in 1914, however, Clark was primed and ready. And even more fortuitously, he was already at work crafting a preliminary notebook of English words. So on one hand then, in this notebook, he was busy collecting forms such as Gallic place names, other aspects of words in time that were, as he noted, likely otherwise to be forgotten, and as he said, were therefore in need of urgent preservation. But on the other, he also found himself turning to markedly contemporary forms as recorded in the popular press, such as Reichland and Pan-Germanism or acclimatization, and con contemplating the claims that these two might make upon memory and the life of words. Reichland, for example, a proper name was not in the OED, he noted, but surely, he thought, it required linguistic observation and record. Pan-Germanism was referenced, but Murray had decided in his entry of the early 20th century that a definition was probably unnecessary. Here too, though, Clark stressed, change was surely culpable. Um, acclimatization and related words were similar. So we can see an entry for this, again, written by Murray um, in the very first fascicle of the OED as it was published in 1884. And this little bit just covered words between A and and. So it was published in, in part. So this was the very first part of the OED. Uh, but Murray's definition in 1884, so the process of acclimatizing, of being acclimatized or habituated to a new climate, no longer, Clark observed, seemed to work with the uses that he was now gathering up in this very first notebook. So instead, as in the clippings that Clark recorded from the Scots, say the Scotsman in February 1914, here in relation to Alsace-Lorraine, Language and time had clearly moved on, as the Scotsman said, for example, using acclimatisation or acclimatised. The imperial government has for 40 years pursued the policy of acclimatisation, in inverted commas, but the two provinces are still far from being absorbed or acclimatised. So acclimatisation of this kind, Clark stressed, was clearly political, based in discourses of power and attempted compulsion as well as in, con in concepts of national identity and resistance, Clark redefined with careful reference to the historical moment. Acclimatization in this sense, he specified, now meant the endeavor to compel Alsace-Lorraine to become Prussian in sentiment and aspirations, meaning was recalibrated for a new and ominous era. Pan-Germanism gained a similar focus. Surely this was, Clark said, the idea of making Germany mistress of all Europe. So if, as Murray had commented in, on one of his early prefaces for the dictionary and saying that, quote, the new word or sense is apt to die as soon as it's born, ashamed of its own newness, ashamed of the italics or inverted commas, which apologise for its very existence or question its legitimacy. Clark, in words in wartime, decided to make a careful record before this might happen. Inventories, as he realized, could be made in very different ways. So could biographies, proper names, brand names, incidental usages, all aspects that formal lexicography tended to neglect could, in a private collection, instead all be gathered up and defined as he wished. As Clark reflected, for example, in one of his own early notebooks, no student of national psychology 
is likely to make a complete album of August to October 1914 clippings in order to perpetuate the memory of this phase of the history of humanity. So Words in Wartime then was from the very beginning seen as a deliberate form of memory and memory making and distinct and distinctive in what it aimed to include. The notebooks then um, still remain a treasure trove of often now forgotten words, senses and phrases. Over a thousand entries, for instance, were gathered by Clark just over the very first few weeks of war, jostling for space in his first notebook. And there's a little clipping from his first notebook. It's a bit more of a close up there. And um, this was, as Clark noted with evident regret, far too crowded. He'd underestimated, he acknowledged, the fascination and breadth of what he would find. Clippings and annotations are compressed, while his red asterisks, liberally used all over the place, as you can see, indicate his um, attempt to build in a kind of comparative reading with the OED as it then existed. So the asterisks mark out forms where no comparable record existed in the dictionary at that point. Um, Two weeks later then, you can see it here, look on things, words like engine trouble or biplane. Some of this is because the OED was a very historical dictionary. And of course, if you see Ata Ant was published in 1884. So the language of biplane um, kind of really becomes established probably after the OED had published the relevant fascicles. So some of this is a bit of time lag, but others are very, very, um, words very much of the moment actually. So there's um, every page, particularly in the early notebooks looks like this actually. He was astounded by how much which he could actually find that was new. Two weeks later then, a second notebook was full as well, tracing still other red asterisk forms such as fighting front, one of a range of new expressions used in negotiating the equally new trench warfare, which was then coming into being on the Western Front, or say fiction factory, a very useful term, which clearly has its own resonances for the fake news of modern use, but here, which served in World War I as a scathing and, and propagandist coinage used in referring to the German press. As for trench warfare then, Clark was absolutely fascinated by how words could be a witness to changing events. Um, so how, for example, did you refer to trench warfare before trench warfare? as a term came into being. So as he, and this, this is what this slide is doing, is, is showing Clark's um, exploration of the wide range of, or some of the wide range of expressions that were in use actually, as writers strove to negotiate and renegotiate a history that was unfolding day by day. So trench warfare is a term he finds in October 1914. Uh, but before that, and also across the first autumn of the war, he became very interested in this language of siege. So it's an entry that had recent, very recently been published in the OED, and that was all about encircling, enclosing something, cutting communications off. Uh, from somewhere until that place gives in. But it didn't seem to work, as Clark observed, with the kind of usage that he saw across this first autumn. And so um, uh, you can see it's a siege war, a compound noun, much in favour, September to November 1914. He often gives these quantity markers. He's very interested in the kind of prominences that were the rise and fall of words, really. Um, as Samuel Johnson says, the budding and falling away as language changes. So, uh, um, and, and it, it, so he has siege siege war, siege warfare, more red asterisk. So he says, you know, we can quote like from the evening news, a regular siege war has been in progress for two, two days. But I think what Clark was interested in, the fact it wasn't a very regular war, nothing was being encircled. It was just very static and very, very, very linear. Um, and then, you know, again, by December 1914, it's a sort of siege war, um, defensive, not, not moving, not making an offensive movement forward. Um, it's often also referred to loads of other terms actually around the time. I've put a few of them here. Barbed wire war is a very typical term at that time. An underground war, that was a very early one, October. What may be termed an underground war, winter on the horizon, their men and guns lie buried out of sight. Um, he, was particularly, he particularly liked though this next citation, March 1915, 
which gave one of those kind of very illuminating uh, quotations that Murray would have um, enjoyed very much as well, where you get a term and also a kind of quasi definition within the same quotation. So as, Clark, as this, this clipping says, this is siege warfare, as everyone knows. But what everyone knows about siege warfare by the time we get around to March 1915 is that it's not what we might have thought it was before the um, First World War began. Instead, it's linear, immense, running over 400 miles and means holding the line of trenches, stretching from the Belgian coast to Belfort. So, um, so those kind of transitions, the messiness of language change taking place under your eyes is what Clark is really, really interested in. And so by October 1914, just to consider, just to look a bit more of this early history, we got a third notebook full as well, providing evidence on still more red asterisk words for early war, such as shell shields and rest chambers. Um, these also were other aspects of the changing architecture of modern war, trench warfare as it came into being. Rest chamber, for example, was an early reference to the kind of dugouts, which later became much more familiarised in wartime comment. It swiftly disappeared. Or as in this one, for example, Tipperary, a little nice little entry for Tipperary, a song that had already been established as a musical favourite before the war, but which was now redefined by Clark as the soldiers marching song of 1914. Again, as he argued, meaning had changed. When people referenced Tipperary, they didn't echo or they didn't refer to the music hall. Instead, it was about a song of departure of soldiers leaving, of departing for the Western Front. Preserved too was the also the otherwise unrecorded Black August. Black, as in the Black Monday or Black Wednesday of modern use, was laden with foreboding. 1914, when war broke out states a careful definition in Clark's neat hand. So the challenges of trying to capture living history and the lexical records that this reveals can even so be obvious. What happens under our noses ought to be the clearest, says Julian Barnes, for instance, in his novel, The Sense of an Ending. Yet usually, as Barnes warns, it's the opposite that's true. Paradoxically, it's past events that seem clear cut, definitive in their depiction of what happened, of who did what and what this meant. Living history that under our noses is in contrast presented as the most deliquescent, that which is most liable to fade away, to dissolve in relation to time and memory, unless carefully observed. Our own recent history offers perhaps similar challenges, the Guardian might recently have urged us to make space in our COVID dictionary for another new entry. Um, you can see this on the right of my slide. Here it was referencing the sunshine shift, which it uh, defined as a play on the zero hours contract in which hospitality workers were guaranteed work only when the sun is out. But in reality, even sunshine shift is probably already obsolescent given our current roadmap in the return to normal life. I'm hoping you can hear my inverted commas. So in our COVID dictionary then, the meta language of COVID, R numbers, roadmaps and social distancing might now all claim a distressing familiarity, but will we? In time, remember the sunshine shift, all the distinctive resonances of stay alert, or the demands and prevalence of pandemic puppies or lockdown hair, or the nuances of last summer's mask etiquette. So, or here too, will deliquescence intervene? So for Clark then, it's precisely this, and the kind of history that happens under one's nose, or perhaps more to the point, under one's eyes and ears, that between 1914 and 1919 would therefore preoccupy his endeavours. In his notebooks then, great writers are conspicuous by their absence. The kind of emotion recollected in tranquility, as prized by Wordsworth, was made irrelevant. Instead, his reading deliberately focused on the social and geographical spectrum of the daily press, including then the Daily Express, the Scotsman, the Evening News and the Telegraph, as well as the local Essex press and local Scots newspapers sent to him by his brother. And as well as, I suppose we should add, what particularly, what would clearly require the particular test of fortitude, the pages of the star. 
This was clearly by no means his natural lit uh, literary habitat. Clark described this as a low class paper containing very little real news, very few sensible articles and a profusion of second rate advertisements. It was, as he added with some distaste, the concoction of bounders. But <laughs> it was even so scrutinized carefully and with conspicuous objectivity, providing, say, memorable clippings as here on the otherwise unregistered recruiting barometer and its metaphorical mercury that appeared outside the town hall in Manchester, testing the patriotism temperature of the city in relation to the number of recruits that were recu recruited from hour to hour. So, uh, um, so, or to equally good effect, it was the star that provided evidence on non-starter, a word that was added into the OD in 1976, uh, but here used in memorably, as uh, Clark noted, in describing the Kaiser, a non-starter, the Kaiser, who was nominated only two months ago as the next recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Clark defined it as metaphor, a horse which is struck out of engagement to run a race. So, uh, but it was the Express which equally memorably um, yielded his very illuminating evidence of Peaky Blinder, uh, and another term which would make a much later appearance in the OED being added in 1982 by Robert Birchfield in his own revisions to the dictionary, and in which wartime uses do not appear. But Peaky Blinder, in words in wartime, again refers to the Kaiser, illuminatingly described then as the boss Peaky Blinder of Berlin, and again with a nicely embedded definition. So, so for Clark then, words of this kind were all underlined, extracted, and pasted into the relevant notebook. In Clark's reading then, words abounded. Even a single clipping, as here, was replete with words and senses that demanded scrutiny. Um, this one, for example, has got captive balloon, it's got crater, a word that was in the OED, but only at that point defined in terms of volcanoes, whereas uh, Clark's was in, very interested in the craters that lay on the battlefield of the Western Front. Likewise to pit, it's another word that he saw of interest, Murray had just defined this in the OED, but only in terms of creating shallow indentations. But as Clark observed, pitting on the Western Front uh, in the resulting craters could easily swallow a small cottage. So, uh, and of course, we've got slang appearing here just at the very bottom, unhealthy, euphemistic, meaning very dangerous. Being on the Western Front was indeed unhealthy, but um, and not an activity that was advised for the faint of heart. So posters, postcards, wrappers from soap, or books, and books of matches could and would elicit similarly scrutiny. While as on the slide, um, you know, he, he took lots of freedoms, you know, uh, again, liberated from the idea of sending neat slips to the OED. Um, he started doing multiple annotations on the same little scrap of paper. Um, he was really interested too in letters from the front. These were often reprinted in the popular press, and these were read and, note and annotated really, really carefully across words in wartime, whether this was in terms of documenting new technologies in what seemed a strikingly modern war, or trench slang and its varied expressivities. So this is the letter, for example, um, that was originally written from the front, by Private Yerbury from the London Rifle Brigade, and it was sent to his brother in England on the 23rd of December 1914. Um, as you can see from the clipping, it then reappeared in the Daily Express the following week. Clark collected all the adverts from the Express and other newspapers that uh, offered the payment of quite handsome sums of money if you sent in an authentic letter from the front. And so, so we can see this very neat transition. So here it is, and it was on the Western Front, and then it comes back to um, England, then it goes into the Daily Express, and then a couple of days later, it's extracted and annotated by Clark and making a further appearance in words in wartime, actually. So um, used here then in illustrating Bounder, uh, not in OD at that point in time, um, Murray thought Bounder was rather too resonant of undergraduate slang and probably would not survive, so he decided not to include it. And we've also got words like bucked, cheered, you know, as well as the very, very euphemistic mess about used in relation to the aftermath of an attack. So, um, so no doubt the regiment will be messed about a bit, but that can't be helped. Um, so, be they right or be they wrong, Clark wrote, letters offered impressions of the war that were not part of official and therefore ordered sources. Their immediacy was prized. 
So too in words of wartime, uh, words in wartime was that of reported speech. So um, in words in wartime notebooks, then we can encounter things like the otherwise unrecorded term service rations, another red asterisk form for Clark in an interview with a Smithfield salesman here as used in discussing meat supplies for the home front. Or we can say um, turn to an eyewitness of the bomb dropping um, in England for evidence of tip cart. He said that the crew of the Zeppelin appeared to go suddenly mad and drop bombs as if they were turning them out of a tip cart. So if in the OED, likewise, we can get an entry for Tinder lighter, though it belatedly appears in 1986. In the OED, it's Violet Asquith, daughter of the British Prime Minister, who's documenting relevant wartime use. But in Clark, it's tinder lighters and their use instead of matches on active service were are instead verified via an interview in the Daily Express with a Mr Perkins, head of the company which produced them. We're sending them out by the hundred gross every week, said Mr Perkins. Many thousands of tinder lighters are now being made in London and sent to the troops in the trenches where they are found to be more reliable and easier to carry. So it's the diversity and the striking inclusiveness of what Clark records that is a really conspicuous feature of his work. Telling the story for Clark is a markedly liberal activity. Total war, a conflict where non-combatants as well as fighting fronts form the object of attack, is historically, for example, often seen as a prime marker of World War I. But Clark's to total war encompassed right from the very beginning, not only transgressive methods of this kind and their human consequences, but also traced the percolation of war in relation to food and fashion, childhood or old age, motoring and sport or changing gender roles and expectations. We can thereby witness, say, the emergence and familiarisation of forms key to total war, such as Zeppelin warfare, Zeppelin bomb or Zeppelin defence, as well as the swiftly outdated Zeppelinophobia, one of my favourite words, actually, and originally defined as an entirely irrational fear of possible Zeppelin attack. But for Clark, though, associated ramifications of total war were also intricately woven into the minutiae of a daily life, as in the emergence, say, of the intriguing Zeppelin barometer, depicted as a useful addition to the home. So as we can see here, uh, this, you put this next to your actual barometer and um, you can map the probability of a Zeppelin attack, uh, attack depending on the air pressure. So um, were we in the middle of World War I, I hate to tell you, but it would definitely be Zepps coming today. So, uh, and incidentally, we can see the Zepps, the familiarization of the language of Zeppelins and Zeppelin attacks. So a Zeppelin barometer is, is, is very interesting there. Or, but he's equally interested in things like Zeppelin 90. Um, another new expression, again, not doesn't make its way into formal lexicography, but was prompted in wartime use by the newly vexing matter of just what do you wear during a nighttime raid on the home front? Um, and home front was itself, of course, yet another idiom of wartime use, which Clark pays attention to. So as we can see from things like this, um, across Clark's notebooks, the historical principles of formal lexicography were carefully and systematically redirected to create instead this, this kind of ambitious micro history of English use, offering vivid snapshots of time and change or intriguing prehistories, which still remind of Clark's abilities as a reader, as in say psychological warfare and given as um, being used from 1940 in the current OED, but Clark's got it already there in 1914, for example. Um, and, and just a willingness to incorporate just almost anything as an evidence, as evidence of language and its use. I'm quite fond also of the lion right here. It's a kind of early pre-digital um, iPad, maybe uh, ideal for reading and writing in bed. He was very interested in the creativities of um, brand names as, part, as a response to war. Um, sea attack on the right hand side is another term that he was also um, quite intrigued by. This appears um, meaning 
um, quite distinctively, an attack on land from sea and used across the war um, after the attack on Whitby from um, uh, battleships in the North Sea in December 1914. Um, so we might likewise recently have found ourselves preoccupied with our own mask wearing, but gas masks for the home, or what were termed civilian respirators, were other linguistic artefacts which, for Clark, demanded linguistic record and attention, and which also still typically remain silent in formal lexicography. So as here, we can purchase our own gas poison protection face mask for only two shillings, actually, as advertised in the evening news in 1915. So, and I'm also quite fond, uh, oh, there's a the psychological warfare one, and there's um, hand grenades as well uh, for the home. I think these are rather interesting as a kind of response to Zeppelin raid dangers so that you can have, if you feel imminently threatened by fleets of Zeppelin airships carrying incendiary bombs, um, you can now purchase your own domestic hand grenade, hand, uh, hand grenade. So absolutely harmless, we're told that even a little child can play with them. So um, it's described as yet another anti-ZEP precaution. And anti-ZEP is for Clark, yet another word that claimed interest of its own. So as this suggests then, Clark's notebooks clearly present a bewildering richness, a word hoard of serious extent and range. This lecture can present only a tiny, tiny snapshot of what he gathered up. What is also clear though throughout all of this is the way in which he really relished the freedom and autonomy that the notebooks afforded. Not least since, should words and meanings exceed the available space in one notebook, another notebook, as the Bodleian came to realise, always lay in wait. As Macbeth saw the murderous dagger before him handled to his hand, I see a row of quarto notebooks, all wagging bodily woods in hope of shelter, as Clark had confessed in early 1914, before even thinking of words in more time. Um, and he confessed this to his close friend, Falcon and Madden, who was sub-librarian of the Bodleian from 1880 and chief librarian during the war in the period 1912 to 1919. Um, even before war began then, it's clear that Clark had, in reality, a very serious notebook habit. And, you know, if the idea of seeing the kindly and liberal Clark as a potential Macbeth can be disorientating, it's maybe useful to remember that even in February 1914, some 300 Clarkian notebooks of this kind had already sought shelter in the Bodleian a surprising total, as the annual report of the curators confirmed, with conspicuous re restraint then in February 1914. And these notebook collections included things like 13 volumes of topographical notes, which Clark deposited in 1893, or numerous volumes of antiquarian collections that he deposited in 1894, or 12 volumes of Molden notes, which made their way to Oxford in 1907. Clark had deposited printed books too, but it's the idea of the manuscript notebook as a repository for potentially vulnerable information. And in particular, his sense of the Bodleian as a shield against temporality. These were already very well established features of his working methods before war began. So words in wartime then, we should note, clearly remained in manuscript by design. It was archived as a cohesive work, mostly in its numbered volumes, and also uh, bearing all the cross-references with his war diary that was also sent to the Bodleian, also in many, many notebook volumes. Um, rather than, for example, um, you know, being kept in Essex, where, of course, he might have decided to revise some publication after the war. Um, so he clearly decided that wasn't something he wanted to do. They, were, they are presented as an archive and deliberately um, placed in the Bodleian. Uh, with equal deliberation, they were not sent to the OED, where, as Clark was aware, their contents might have been dispersed or still were um, discarded. Um, there are, for instance, some very useful records in the OED archives of words Clark did send in, but are stamped in red, not used. So Words in Wartime was conceived as a collective enterprise in its own right, 
and it was deposited by Clark himself, usually during his many trips to Oxford and his visits to Madden or his dear librarian, as his letters to Madden often begin. We could end then with Madden and the Bodleian. In Madden, for instance, Clark had his ideal librarian, not only given their close and enduring friendship, but also crucially because of Madden's own interest in language and ephemera as historical artifacts. Madden then was not only a great Bodleian librarian and bibliographer, but in another often forgotten history, he was a dedicated reader for the OED in his own right. In fact, he was one of the very few readers whose contributions to the dictionary span the entire history of the first edition. So he was collecting quotations and lexical evidence and corresponding with its editors from the early 1880s to 1928 as well as afterwards. Madden's emphasis then on the historical salience of the trivial and the ephemeral and the obligations that libraries in particular should observe were equally important in this respect. Every product of the press has its value, he stressed. Small libraries, as he acknowledged, must of necessity pass much by, but he added, the obligations of libraries of deposit, such as the Bodleian, were and must be different. These, he said, are right in not rejecting anything because its immediate use is not obvious. Whether this is, he said, the literature of the street in pamphlets or leaflets or ballads, or, as he added, what might unadv unadvisedly be termed trash, all, Madden stressed, required preservation. So in the Bodleian, words in wartime had, as a result, also found its ideal repository. Even so, collection and deposition remain only part of the story. In the Bodleian, Clark, as he was well aware, had not only secured preservation for the notebooks which occupied his endeavours across the years of war, but, as he hoped, another way of communicating, like the OED, with readers of his own, and, as he wrote to Murray, with the great community of English scholars. Libraries foster not only conservation, but use. Turn over tenderly, as Clark still urges, for example, alongside countless carefully annotated leaflets and clippings in his notebooks. Turn over carefully. It's not worth much, but its value will not increase by being torn. Words in wartime, then, is in fundamental ways also an increase intriguingly dialogic text with Clark's own voice embedded at a range of points amid the notebooks he so carefully made. Across the years, as readers in our own right, we are then invited to reconsider the value of that which is too easily dismissed as valueless, alongside the daily struggle to comprehend and express a war in words. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Linda, so much for that wonderfully rich talk, which uh, not simply illustrated Andrew Clark's fascination with language, but the fascination of language itself. I think that was a really wonderful uh, tour de force. Thank you. Um, I know we're going to have some uh, questions as I'm watching the, the Q&A, but we've had one in the chat already asking about whether he was interested at all in the language of propaganda. Yes, I'm afraid he was interested in just about everything, actually. <laughs> so, uh, yes, there's a lot of he's very interested in persuasion. And also as a historian, he was very interested in the way in which history was in danger, as he termed it, of being contaminated by the kind of forms of presentation. So there's an interesting tension at times between his sense of himself as a historian and what events mean as a, as a his, as historical um, facts, but also the way in which how language can act as a kind of prism or a form of presentation. And so quite often you've got this tension between his desire to objectively record language use as he found it. And then every now and then his kind of historical insights get the better of him and he makes some scathing asides like fiction <laughs> in the margin. So, so you do, they, they, they are very interesting. So he's very aware and very interested in this idea of propaganda. And in fact, he makes some of his little, some of his notebooks, he starts making thematic notebooks as well as further stages of experiment. And some of them are called war fictions, actually, which are all about propaganda. So uh, yes, okay, good question. Yes, um, we have just a uh, comment, war and the upheaval it creates, can it be a catalyst for change? I suppose this means linguistic change. 
Yeah, I think that's right, actually. I mean, you know, he, he saw, oddly, war as an opportunity, um, you know, because, and he was interested in testing out this idea about does, does language change in war? Is war a prompt for that? Um, Richard Mulcaster, another Renaissance scholar, had said war is such a breeder, for example. And, and then Clark's very interested in the same idea, how and what kind of words are bred in war. So part of it is a kind of obviously a language of technology, the language of modern war. But he was really interested in the stimulus, you know, in all sorts of things, like his interest in female fashion or millinery you know he was he was perplexed we get some other little interesting aside like I have no idea why war is proving so enormously productive in relation to millinery but here's some more examples so uh, yes he's he's intrigued by all of these things so yeah yeah thank you uh, I can't say anything else in the chat at the moment but I, I found it fascinating myself that just the diversity of um, the diversity of sources that he was using from bounders language uh, to the sort of language you might find in the Times leader he, he uh, clearly uh, he has a sense that that language um, is permeating every aspect of society and that there's no sort of standard receive thing that it absolutely in yeah he's incredibly inclusive I mean it does make it very difficult the first time I came across these notebooks I was like well how on earth does one work with these because there were there were words everywhere and it was only in fact oh, oh if everything is being transferred to a database so some of the images you got on the slides are in fact from the actual archive itself and other bits are just bits from the database where everything has been tagged and categorized whether it's relating to gender or fashion or whatever which made it much much easier to work with actually I mean I should say Clark himself by the end thought he'd failed entirely so this was not a project which he was um, happy with by the end uh, just because he felt well may maybe this experiment uh, was not the kind of thing you should do maybe you should wait till the end of war, collate everything, just pick, pick a few examples and, uh, and, and then, you know, and then create an alphabetic index, actually. So uh, he did start to doubt his methods by the end. But I, I think it's the immediacy, actually, and the fact that he keeps redefining words as you go through the war that makes it very interesting. So you start to see just how messy language is as a kind of response. OK, we have another question at the moment um, uh, saying, um, as far as you can tell, um, do you think he read newspapers every day? I mean, was he, um, you know, was he someone who sat down to scour a whole series of newspapers every day in, in that sort of, had he sort of that uh, method or was it more haphazard? Um, in the early years, it's pretty regular, actually, not absolutely every day, but, you know, certainly, you know, on a number of occasions over a week. It depended as well what was happening with the individual newspapers. He says he only cut newspapers up, uh, with, 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 which were the ones he felt able to dispose of. So his charitable instincts could get the better of him. So the Daily Express disappears for a while because he decided to donate it for the use of, of um, wounded soldiers in nearby Braintree, for example. So, uh, so sometimes and if there's something very calamitous that happens in war, then all the newspapers sometimes were bought up before he could get to them. So, uh, and even the newspapers he did clip up were the ones that had made their way round the village. He shared the newspapers with, and then they gradually, so, so that's why sometimes it's difficult to say, oh yes, he read this on this day, because they, he, he sends his newspapers around the village for the benefit of those who want to be able to read what's going on and weren't able to access um, uh, newspapers as readily as he could so so it's it's a very kind of you know inclusive project that way round so uh, but by the later years of war then war itself starts to impact on Clark and um, he loses the people who'd helped him at the rectory who chopped the wood and fed the pony and tended to the car and he starts having to do all this himself and he writes some really sad letters to Madden saying you know I'm desperate for a chance of reading and writing but instead I'm hewing wood until midnight so so it's interesting how real war also impacts on how he reads and makes the project. It's fascinating, yes. I mean, we have uh, another question about, uh, could you tell us a little more about any categories he excludes and perhaps why? For example, itineraries, undergraduate slang or something like that. Does he make exclusions of that nature? 
Um, not particularly. The, the bits that, I mean, I guess as a Church of England clergyman, he does get rather annoyed with the loose use of Christian terminology. I think that that is one bit which prompts a kind of lapse in his objectivity. So when people talk about rechristening towns, um, there was a lot of renaming going on as you tried to shed German infants. And he doesn't like things like, but he still records them because, you know, that was the thing about being with the OED, the OED training he'd had was absolutely vital because as the early lectures for that, for the foundational lectures set up the OED, the emphasis was that you must be a historian, not a critic. It doesn't matter whether you like or dislike something. The important thing is that it is in fact recorded. So even bits where Clark is like, yes, you know, <laughs> inappropriate use as we might say today, he's still recording them actually. So yeah, there are no major exclusion zones actually, so, which, is, uh, which is quite impressive. We have one comment uh, from uh, Jim Buchanan who says that there's a theory that women rush out to buy hats if they think there's going to be a war because new hats are among the first <laughs> items that are going to be on <laughs> That's and That must be right. Clark didn't know that one, but that's absolutely brilliant. That, that must be the explanation. Yeah, he was he was very interested in the, the, the number of items of female clothing that could reflect the influence of war. Like the, he, he liked the silken bayonet belt, actually, which has absolutely nothing to do with the pragmatics of war but you would just wear this rather nice silken uh, bayonet belt as a woman you see to signify your kind of allegiance and of course ladies khaki was something else he was very interested in and uh, let's say women's trench coats you know called things like the Somme buy the Somme today as your <laughs> or you could buy the Marn as well he collects all of these I mean this, these these trends for naming actually I mean, it now seems extraordinary that you might want to buy your desired model of trench coat, the coat called the Somme, but no, it's all there in words and more time. Thank you. Well, I, I shall certainly remember the Zeppelin nighties. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's even poems written about the Zeppelin nighties, but I didn't think it was nice for Zeppelin raids. Was one idea. Uh, we have um, just a, a question from Alan James. It says, I think you mentioned in passing a list of Gaelic place names. Do I take it that this is in the collection of Clark's Noakes in the library because it would be of interest to the official Scottish Gaelic Place Names Agency? Yes, it is. It's buried in, in one of his notebooks. You can e do email me afterwards and I'll, I'll try and locate the precise reference for you. Yeah, it's one of his early pre-Words in Wartime um, notebooks of English words is where he was kind of playing around with how you might do a project of this kind. So, uh, but yes, he's very interested on that comment, like, uh, yeah, likely otherwise to be forgotten. He's got quite a lot of stuff because he was Scottish, um, I should say. And uh, that's why we've got quite a lot of the Scotsman. Uh, is one of his favourite sources, actually. So it doesn't get this kind of scathing comments that the star does. So, um, yeah, so he's he's got a lot of evidence of Scots words, Scots culture, and he talks, of, he uses a lot of his uh, Scots dialect words as well. So in the course of his diary. So yes, no, do contact me, that's fine. So Alan, if you contact, uh... If you contact Linda afterwards, perhaps that'd be all right. Uh, we have a question from Marina Warner. Uh, does he give the origin of Peaky Blind? <laughs> <laughs> um, only by referring it to, to the kind of the language of the scum youths of Birmingham, you see, so uh, as within uh, as within the actual um, entry. It wasn't in any dictionary of the time as far as um, he could find out. It certainly wasn't in the OED. So he was he was very interested in this um, very memorable quotation, actually. I, I you know it always makes me smile when I come across that bit, particular bit of the notebook as the Kaiser, as the boss peaky blinder of Berlin. So, uh, yes, but that's. The, 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 the actual article is much longer that he gives and it does elaborate much more on the social circumstances of um, those who were termed peaky blinders. So he underlines quite a lot on that particular clipping. Um, I think um, just one more from Mark Thompson. Um, did he uh, provide any summary conclusions at the end of the war, pulling together his thoughts thematically or on any other basis? Well, it would have been nice if he did, but no, he was quite sad at the end of the war. His his wife had died. It's very like Johnson, actually, you know, <laughs> sort of. Um, and he was increasingly convinced that he'd, he'd worked, done all of this and maybe it wasn't, um, you know, very, it wasn't maybe what he wanted. There, were, I don't think that any lexicographers are entirely happy with what they have achieved. And, you know, whether this is a, a you know, a, a dictionary or, you know, a, a collection or a, I don't know, you know, it, it's such a kind of diverse, 
were sort of, you know, multidisciplinary kind of text. So, so in a way, he does fit into the kind of, you know, the typical, you know, the tears of the lexicographer, as it's usually. Um, so he was very, I mean, he was very sad at the end of the war because, you know, although the one of the terms that he records is thankful village, a thankful village is one, uh, you know, which where which didn't lose any of its sons as they went to war. But Great Lees was not a thankful village. Actually, it's a very sad letter. He writes to Madden in the library just saying there are so few of the boys from this village left to come back. So so in a way, he, he ends with this kind of um, rather, you know, you know, downcast sense, really, that, you know, was it worth it? Was war worth it, actually? You know, so but he's most reflective, actually, in the letters to Madden, which links him very closely with the Bodleian, which makes, you know, doing this talk particularly appropriate today. I, I think that's about all, the only, um, that's about all the time we have for questions. So thank you so much, Linda, uh, for giving us, I mean, taking us not just into the uh, the content, but also the context uh, of the Alan Clark, um, um, of the, the Andrew Clark diaries and, uh, and um, scrapbooks. And I think for me, what came across was just the, the, the symbiosis of language and experience, you know, as the, the lexus of the past just proves to be completely inadequate. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. That, uh, language is a very living thing, but I think you've given us a really wonderful insight into what is clearly a treasure trove of um, uh, linguistic uh, knowledge, and we look forward to the, to the book when it is published later this year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Bye-bye.